Okay, and we're live. Thank you for joining us today for this uh, IUCN webinar on uh, nature-based solutions for our International Day in Biodiversity, for Biodiversity. So first of all, I want to welcome and thank you, say thank you to all of our audience. Uh, we really need you here today. Nature-based solutions and biodiversity are very complicated issues. <laughs> And that would be our first technical issue as I'm listening to myself. Um, today for International Biodiversity Day, it's a celebration of the beautiful biodiversity around us, but it's also a day where we look to biodiversity for our solutions, not just for people, but for also nature. And I'm here with my, my boss Radhika Murthy and a whole diverse panel because we work on nature-based solutions. And we wanna talk about the connection between biodiversity and nature and look towards you know, what are the challenges we face and what can you at, with us do and take action on to overcome them? So we're together around the world. We have a panel or a Zoom room full of diverse participants that represent a lot of the stakeholders that we have um, as part of nature-based solutions. And today we're gonna to be discussing the growing momentum of nature-based solutions. Maybe you've heard of the term nature-based solutions. Maybe it's the first time you're hearing it. Maybe you work in this field. Maybe you consider yourself an expert. Today, we're gonna to hammer down the definition and look at the connection to biodiversity. We're seeing such a huge momentum behind the nature-based solutions group from the private sector to the public sector, governments, NGOs, local communities, explorers. And some of those representatives are in this Zoom room today with us. Since IUCN coined the term nature-based solutions, it's become really a global movement. And so today we're gonna to have a little bit more of an interactive format. Our aim here is not to be talking heads presenting some slides, although we will start with a presentation from Radhika Murthy, uh, Dr. Radhika Murthy on nature-based solutions, but that'll be quite short, around 15 to 20 minutes. And then we're gonna open up into a guided discussion with the participants in the Zoom room, which we've really tried to to gather to reflect the different stakeholders in nature-based solutions. And so welcome, um, and I think we will kick it off there. Uh, Radhika, over to you to share your slides. Radhika, your mic is on mute. There, now, that might work. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. Thanks, Rakib. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining from around the world for us uh, and, and spending this one hour of your day on International Biodiversity Day. We are part of a bigger group of programs at the IUCN headquarters. And in 2012, that program was actually named the Nature-Based Solutions Group. And it's led by uh, our boss, Stuart McGuinness, who's one of the co-authors of the definition of nature-based solutions. And really this work has been going on since as early as 2009 in defining the concept, but it's not new work. It's putting a framework around a lot of the things we've done in the past three decades on uh, conservation livelihoods, forest landscape restoration, ecosystem-based adaptation. So building on that, there is a definitive framework now for us to move forward with how to actually mobilize the use of nature for our solutions. So just quickly going back to the very basics of how we derive, um, let me just minimize this how we derive uh, our solutions from ecosystem functions from nature in terms of uh, coastal defense with our coral reefs, uh, water storage, water provision, using reed beds, streams, uh, uh, carbon sequestration, flood regulation. So how can, how can nature function as infrastructure and how do we do more of that actually in, in being able to use nature for societal benefits? And the current definition of IUCN that was launched in 2016, it has um, seven societal challenges, although it's not limited to this. This is a growing area of work and a growing, evolving definition. So how can nature be a solution for climate change, adaptation and mitigation, food security, water security, human health, socioeconomic development, disaster risks, 
and eco reversing ecosystem degradation and biodiversity loss itself. So these seven key societal challenges that we face as a world and how do we, instead of being able to address them at the expense of nature, work with nature to derive those benefits and gains. Human health, and let me point out, human health and socioeconomic development are areas of work that are perhaps the least developed. And I think right now with, with, with the current situation we face, this provides us with an excellent opportunity to actually work on that together, build new alliances, work in innovative ways. So the definition itself uh, is, is um, three actions of protecting, sustainably managing or using and restoring nature both modified or natural ecosystems in a way where it, we can derive our societal needs, climate change, food, et cetera, as I mentioned earlier. But it, this needs to be done in an effective and adaptive way where it's not at the expense of biodiversity, but it's simultaneously providing human well-being and biodiversity benefits. And there are lots of uh, aspects to it, you know, the time frame over which, um, which a benefit is derived, what are the trade-offs, et cetera, and, and we'll quickly get into that. So just quickly, um, the three pillars of nature-based solutions, for example, Switzerland uh, spends um, uh, a lot of resources in protection forests, so protecting certain forests at a certain gradients, which help manage the avalanche risks and um, uh, landslide risks. And uh, this is, sorry, that was my mistake. And this is in uh, complementarity with um, uh, great infrastructure, looking at uh, acceptable risk calculations. So really looking at forests at, at a certain contour gradient and how to make sure that it's protected as a green infrastructure that reduces their risks to avalanches, rock falls and landslides. Similarly, a good example from the Lost Plateau in China from as far back as 1994, large-scale uh, large, large restoration of the Lost Plateau, which generated um, uh, jobs for over 50% of the population over time. It uh, took millions of people out of poverty and it reduced sedimentation rates and uh, landslide risks by up to 60-70%. And then there's an example for sustainable use. Uh, in Bogota, there's 4 million people who depend on um, uh, a watershed further upstream. So instead of putting in a new water plant, how do they put it, how do they manage and protect and sustainably use water from their natural watersheds? So here's an example of a watershed further out of the municipality's boundary, but working across different uh, sub-regional mechanisms to establish a trust fund that can actually help protect this watershed and secure water supply for the city instead of building dams and large scale water infrastructure. So what's the difference? What's new? Um, Nature-based solutions is let's say um, the, the development of a, a second pillar, a new paradigm, are, but using conservation actions. And at least in IUCN's case, 71 years of our experiences in how to protect, conserve, restore nature. So we'll always have the safeguarding nature aspect. There are species, there is flora, fauna, areas which absolutely need to be protected because of the biodiversity value, because of the fragility, because of all the flora and flora contained there. That is not necessarily nature-based solutions. That's not what we're saying that every conservation action is nature-based solutions. What we're saying is every nature-based solution is based on a conservation action. So that's where using those conservation norms and sciences and extending that reach and relevance of all that knowledge and expertise to safeguarding society through deriving those benefits that people need. And uh, there's been a lot of confusion on what is nature-based solutions, what is not. So first is, it's, it's uh, first as previous slide, not all conservation is nature-based solutions. We'll still have to do conservation for conservation. And similarly, there's different elements to how nature is used by, by society. So we're trying to differentiate it in three ways. Nature-derived solution, for example, wind, hydropower, where you're using 
nature to derive a solution, but not necessarily um, providing any inputs back into nature to maintain it, to enhance its biodiversity, to protect it. A lot of this is done sustainably, but that's not the primary aim of balancing out human needs and conservation needs within that same solution. Second is nature inspired. So a lot of bioengineering, a lot of biomimicry, looking at um, ways of cooling buildings, ways of mimicking nature for, within infrastructure. And then the third is nature-based solutions where you're getting something by giving back to nature and making sure there's proper ecological functionality, there is a healthy biodiversity, which is either maintained or enhanced so that it can give us back what we need as our societal need, uh, challenges. Uh, we mapped this out, we did a very um, uh, basic exercise of looking at how it's linked to um, sustainable development goals. We can clearly see there's direct links to uh, no poverty, one, zero hunger, good health and well-being, clean water sanitation, decent work and economic growth, which we really want to work with our partners to develop around, um, nature-based solutions in, sustain in cities. This was really an area of work led by our European office that got the momentum um, going as well for nature-based solutions. Then climate action, life below water, life on land. So, so these are direct SDGs that NBS can contribute to, but then there are many other indirect ways it contributes to the others. For, ex for example, peace, justice, uh, and number 17, partnerships, new and innovative partners, partnerships that will happen to make nature-based solutions a reality. And it makes sense because if you look at this diagram from, uh, I think it's the so Stockholm Environment uh, Institute, the very foundations of meeting societal and economic needs is the four goals directly related, are the four goals directly related to the biosphere. So this brings home that message that nature is the foundation of meeting our socioeconomic needs and NBS can be a definitive framework around which we can actually mobilize this. Again, another point, it's not a standalone solution. We live in a very modified world full of infrastructure. So it's not a standalone alone panacea as a solution. Rather, it's a very much a solution that can help complement um, other solutions like gray infrastructure, like human-based solutions, technological solutions, etc. So it's not a standalone solution as such, but very much working with the realities of, of the world we live in. And um, we've been working in the last year to actually work uh, on societal, work on nature-based solutions and put a bit of um, framework around it in terms of how to guide people to design nature-based solutions. So it's a solution where depending on the inputs and the context, you will get an output. So it's not something where we can always predict what the outcome will be. So what we thought was to design a standard, which is more a facilitative standard that can guide the processes to come up with a good solution rather than judge the solution in the end and provide a certification or not, because that's a bit challenging in the context of nature-based solution. So we started this work about a year ago, a facilitative standard looking to design, verify, scale up NBS, um, based on a lot of different aspects um, in terms of different areas of knowledge. So we needed the conservation expertise, the science, the social scientists, the traditional knowledge, the policy people. It's such a cross-cutting issue that we went out and crowdsourced this standard. So we did two consultation processes over 500 people across 100 different countries have been involved, um, leading us to looking at almost a thousand comments in, in, in how to use all of that knowledge to enrich this um, standard and inform it. And we've really followed uh, quite closely the ICL process alliance of good practice, where we hope in the, in, that it, in the, in, once it's finalized from our side, we can actually get uh, ICL alliance of code, good practice um, stamp on it. So we're looking at eight criteria. And again, these are very focused on the processes you can use to design a good solution where the societal challenge is being met, where you're considering design at scale, what is happening outside that immediate site that you need to think of that can add value to your solution, but that can also become a risk to your solution if you don't think of the bigger scale within which you're operating that solution. And then over time, how to scale it out and, and make it um, 
a more widely applicable nature-based solutions. The third criteria is about biodiversity net gain, fourth, economic viability, and five, the social aspects of inclusive governance, making sure there's no further inequity, there's no further marginalization. Rather, this is very much looking at who benefits, how do we make those decisions, how transparent they are, and how do we make sure that everybody, all the stakeholders within that solution are brought along in the process. The reality of it is there'll be uh, balancing trade-offs. What do we need to give up today for a long-term benefit? Who loses, who gains? How do we work that out? And how can we be transparent uh, and inclusive in that? And then the seventh is the adaptive management aspect. Part of that is webinars like what we're doing today, looking at what is the learning that needs to keep feeding back into this concept, the framework, the standard, so that we can together evolve this, this definition into making nature-based solutions happen. And the eighth part is the sustainability of it. How do we embed it into policy mechanisms? How do we get them recognized in national uh, commitments for multilateral processes, how do we make sure nature-based solutions are not done in isolation, but very much along, along or within a country's economic uh, strategy, a country's social well-being, a country's um, international commitments? How this all comes together, as I said, the starting point for the design is looking at one or more challenges, making sure that the, the scale aspect is uh, taken into account, finding that balance immediate and long-term balance amongst the three pillars of sustainable development, uh, biodiversity, economic, and, uh, and social, inclu social equity, inclusive governance, we call it in this case. And uh, surrounded in that is the act of balancing trade-offs and then making sure that all of this is managed adaptively and making sure that there is that sustainability element where we move from site-based approaches to systems-based approaches and look beyond standalone, uh, standalone, uh, very time-bound actions to being able to go to scale and make NBS the business as usual is what we're trying to do. So I'm gonna stop there. I think that's where, uh, yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Let me just stop sharing my slide and pass it back to Daisy. Brilliant. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Radhika. Um, I think Radhika and I have given that presentation in many different formats to many different audiences, and we're always we're always tweaking it. And one thing we've learned is that every group is different, and 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 the most valuable aspect of our presentations is actually the discussions that follow and the questions. So we we really welcome uh, challenging questions. If you think you have a hard question, that's now is the time to ask it. But this is where we, you know, we get the value from our audience because nature-based solutions do not happen in isolation. They don't happen behind closed doors with a select few. They have to involve everyone, including local participants and local communities especially. And so now we're gonna turn to the interactive discussion component of our, of our webinar. Uh, we have some topics for discussion, but first I'd like to open it up to questions from our Zoom room. Uh, please do not, uh, we've got quite a few participants from uh, organizations such as NORAD or the International Labor Organization to also some represent representatives of youth or region, uh, regional representatives from IUCN um, as well as UNHCR. There's, a, there's quite a few people in the room. So introduce yourself, please. And we'll start off with some questions and uh, then lead on to our discussion points. So does anybody have any questions to get us started? I have two, so yeah. let's start with Kalu, uh, Kaluki, I hope that I pronounced that right. Yes, that's right. Thank you so much. My name is Kaluki Paul Mutuku. Uh, I'm the regional coordinator at Youth for Nature. And Youth for Nature is an international youth led organization that is mobilizing young people to lead on nature based solutions. And, and I really thank uh, Dika for that insightful presentation. I had a question to IUCN. Uh, I wanted to ask how IUCN is supporting the meaningful inclusion of or engagement of young people when it comes to nature-based solutions implementation, and further, how you would recommend that young people can engage better when it comes to NBS actions. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, thank you. So we'll just we'll we'll answer that unless Paul uh, Paul you have a the question also about youth. Otherwise, we'll take that uh, take that next. Thanks, Daisy. Uh, thanks, Daisy, um, and uh, thanks yeah. everybody. I'm wondering what uh, we can all do to create some immediate support for those communities that are relying on ecotourism. Um, ecotourism isn't just a nice to have. It's often the essential infrastructure and economic model that protects so many of our conservation areas. And I wonder what we can do that's immediate, absolutely immediate to help. Um, I think of simple ideas that, you know, if, you, if people were going to see the gorillas this year and spend maybe $5,000, isn't there a way that we could help work out what those communities would get from that 5,000? Let's say it was 500 and send it to them or organizations so they instantly get um, some, some care from people that, that we all benefit from that protection. And, and two second parts of that question are, um, it seems that the, the classic economy has got a real sense of urgency about getting back quickly, getting back to making money the old way and getting back to supporting the stock market the old way. And, have created this urgency because people are in trouble. Uh, people are literally um, just surviving and bumping along the bottom in so many parts of our planet. And um, they've got the sense of urgency because they say we'll have to drop these uh, environmental regulations and other controls just to get back to uh, keeping your jobs. How do we compete with that sense of urgency with a message that is essential, but it's quite long term and can be a bit abstract. You know, we need to stop another pandemic, we need the ultimate vaccine and the ultimate vaccine is more protection. So our message can seem a bit abstract while um, the opponent's message is so, so urgent. And my final very short part is, what part can we play in the ethics and the set of values? The news yesterday was that the American billionaires made 432 billion so far during the pandemic, 430, $434 billion made the richest people in America. That's only America. What part can we all play in the ethics of the global community? And if you make billion, hundreds of billions of dollars because of a pandemic, how can we exert pressure for that money to go to what caused the pandemic, which was the lack of biodiversity? So they're my three elements. Thank you. Okay, so we'll, before we take more questions, I think we'll pause here because we brought up two really important uh, aspects of nature-based solution and, and points we wanted to discuss anyway, which was how, you know, a lot of this is for the next generation. So how do we not just involve youth? Youth already bring value to nature-based solutions. How do we, you know, incentivize that and support youth and young professionals? And we also have this question of how can we provide immediate relief with the example of ecotourism but really, you know, the immediate relief to local communities and people who are at the front line of depending on these ecosystem services. And so we've got quite a, a lot of interest in discussing this. I'd like to, to go back to Radhika first to just mention our, our work on, youth, you know, how youth can get involved because there's a big youth component in, in the Pacific. And then we'll head over to, to Fiji actually, where our, our regional representation, uh, regional director Mason has a few words on ecotourism uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll announce the next two. So Radhika and then Mason. Sure. So for IUCN as, as an organization, um, definitely engagement with youth is of priority. We know that our, our Congress got uh, um, postponed. And as part of that, we still uh, plan to have the youth summit um, in, in bringing um, in bringing youth together in a way where, yes, um, I think a lot of acti activism still needs to happen, but how do we be move beyond that activism to be part of the catalyzed change? Often activism creates a lot of catalysts for change, but then uh, we're making sure we have to make sure that there's engagement in implementing these solutions together. Because uh, if we set this solution in place now, um, you guys are the next people on these driver's seats to actually help us make sure that this continues. So that very sustainability aspect um, that we've included as part of the standard, as part of the thinking around nature-based solution is 
not sustainability just in terms of uh, the actions on the ground and how long they can live on, but who the actors are around it and making sure those actors continue to be in the driver's seat as well as pass it across to the new and upcoming leaders. So to be honest, there is no particular youth strategy for NBS as such at this point, but as we move along, maybe this is something we can think of working together with, uh, with Youth for Nature. How exactly can we make sure that there's very active engagement that goes beyond you know, promoting, um, creating um, activist uh, type of uh, campaigns which, which help us propel interest in action, but don't necessarily make us do those solutions. So I think there's still a lot of work to be done. And for IUCN, this is certainly a priority in learning how we can do this better. Okay, thank you, Radhika. Now we'll, we'll head over to, to our regional director, Mason, in, in Fiji, who we've worked a lot with. And when I was privileged enough to work in the region there, I really got a taste for the importance of youth, uh, but also the beautiful ecosystems that lend so much ecotourism. So Mason, if you could introduce yourself. And after Mason, we will go to Michael from the uh, International Labour Organization, who can speak to us maybe about the labour component and those real benefits we can get. So Mason first. Uh, thank you, uh, colleagues. Uh, let me first uh, just uh, add on to what Radhika has said with regards to uh, our youths. Uh, here in the region, there's a growing awareness amongst the youths on the importance of um, uh, conservation and sustainable development, uh, generally speaking. But uh, the involvement of our youth in nature-based solutions, what we've done is we've uh, talked to the University of Fiji and the University of the South Pacific. and. Uh, that will happen Wednesday, Thursday next week to try and socialize uh, nature-based solutions uh, to the youths and to see whether the uh, university senate can also include uh, nature-based solution as part of the curriculum that they have in the, the universities. So that's the first step that we're taking to socialize and create awareness on uh, nature-based solutions. We've had a number of uh, high level visits from uh, countries like New Zealand uh, coming in to speak to us on how nature-based solutions can be mainstreamed into the region um, here in the Pacific. Now on uh, tourism, uh, we are speaking to the South Pacific Tourism Organization to first of all, find out uh, how badly they are affected by the uh, uh, closure of the tourist uh, uh, sector given the um, COVID-19 pandemic, but more importantly, how we can work with them uh, as IUCN, um, as part of our nature-based solutions to bring some of the smaller uh, resorts, some of the smaller players back onto their feet. So that's happening as we speak, but uh, it's now uh, gaining an awareness, the slow but sure footing of nature-based solutions in some of these important sectors, such as ecotourism. Thank, thank you, Mason. Thank you for that, that uh, excellent overview of what's going out on the other side of the world. And thank you for joining us so late as well. Um, so next up, we uh, Michael, if you could uh, introduce yourself and let us know, you know, maybe give us a taste for what what can we do on the ground? What are what about people who are losing who are who need those jobs and uh, ILO's perspective on that? Uh, thank you very much, Daisy, and good morning, everybody. Um, so I, I have um, I have one comment on that, but I also have a question, which maybe I'll do the comment first. And <laughs> that's great. We <laughs> we love the, questions as well. The harder, the better. <laughs> No, I think the, I was very heartened to hear that in Fiji, the discussions with universities are ongoing in terms of including NBS into the curriculum, because I think that's a really core part of mainstreaming. I'm an engineer and our training, it really influences the way we approach problems. And so I think if at universities, engineers are trained that nature-based solutions are an option for solving some of these problems, whether it's water and sanitation, et cetera. I think that's really critical. Um, so I think, you know, plaudits to, to Fiji, but I think this from ICN, I think, or as a global level, I think there's something we should really think about more. How do we engage, especially at least, or not maybe not especially, but certainly the civil engineering community is a core core 
um, in university should be a core core target group, I think, of this. But I think from the ILO side, I think the real interesting thing about niche-based solutions is the is is the the way it shifts the balance between labor and capital really that get involved in these activities. Um, so I think that in general, from what we've seen so far, the, the labor neighbor um, nature-based solutions would be more labor intensive and um, employ more people, but they also, on the positive side, but it's not necessarily that it would be more expensive because you spend more labor, but I think it actually could be more cost-effective because you substitute some of the capital you would use um, um, by, by mobilizing nature, so to speak. So in terms of coastal defense, instead of buying cement, you plant mangrove and you, you know, nature supplies the capital and it's actually the labor and the knowledge that is the input. And I think that's really an interesting dimension, and it's something area that we would really like to um, explore further um, with with IUCN, but also with other partners to to really understand how this how this dynamic shifts and how how what it really could mean for for uh, for for employment creation. And then maybe the question I have is what I wanted to check is is from an area based perspective is do we see really nature based solutions as kind of using nature outside conservation areas. And so you have kind of a conservation areas where you conserve and the idea of nature-based solutions is to bring nature back into those areas where you are not, which are not designated protected areas or are, am I not understanding that completely <laughs> correctly? So that's really my, my question um, and my comment, thanks. Okay, thank, thank you, Michael. Uh, if I could shoot that over to Radhika, um, to sort of summarize all these discussions and, and perhaps answer, answer Michael's question. So, so first, uh, going back to Paul's question, I think uh, we, we haven't fully answered two elements of that. One is like any immediate uh, immediate support and immediate solutions, which uh, there is an example that Mason shared on the process that we can take to engage and, and uh, be present in the solution making. Um, we know that there is so much to do in terms of things like restoration, um, taking actions on nature already. And that, as uh, Michael was saying, requires that labor, you know? So why not think about generating jobs from conservation actions rather than at the expense of it? Um, just like ecotourism did. So perhaps there again, when ecotourism 10, 20 years ago informed how we set up such ventures, very much based on um, the environment, then perhaps we need to go back and visit that and rethink what else is in there that we can do while there's no access to tourism. Maybe perhaps also promoting more domestic tourism for people to actually get out to, to get to know their own country and, and be able to appreciate it in terms of being part of the solution in, in protecting, preserving their, their own natural resources. So I think these are questions we cannot just answer, that, but they require processes that um, the conservation sector needs to be part of. And that's something perhaps we haven't done. M maybe on our side, we've all, we also been a bit uh, conservative and skeptical saying, you know, these bad guys, they're always out to get nature. So how do we move beyond our thinking to actually build alliances and engage with sectors, which maybe in the past we've also seen as threatening to conservation and really become part of that solution. So I think there we can add, definitely think of processes to engage, but of course we need, there needs to be some exchange and a, and a sort of a movement to start thinking really what is it that we can derive from nature that can provide jobs, livelihood options, et cetera, for immediate relief. And going back to um, uh, the question on, you know, how, how do we shift the balance? So many rich people versus people who need help. There is such a strong philanthropy community that has funded conservation for decades. So what is it that we can do with those setup systems already to maybe change a little bit the focus of not doing conservation, but also doing it for people. So most of the conservation is funded by rich people and foundations. You know, so how do we engage with those setup mechanisms that are set up to maybe go now one step beyond that's needed right now? And then how do we fast track some of those processes? A lot of the times our work in, in mobilizing funding, getting people on board can take a long time, but uh, perhaps this is, a, this is a, an opportunity out of a crisis which could help fast track some of that. Uh, I don't know if I'm answering Michael's question as well in terms of, 
infrastructure versus, I mean, using nature-based solution in isolation to conservation areas. Daisy, am I? I, I can't. <laughs> so yeah. the, yeah. the idea isn't so much to look at it so separately, um, but, but also to, to be cautious in that we're not selling conservation as nature-based solutions. Conservation very much is the foundation of it, but it has to derive a societal benefit. And that's where the, there's a differentiation. But having said that, it's not done in isolation. If you've got, let's say, an area that's under conservation, and if you think about choosing green infrastructure, let's say um, restoring vegetation, coastal vegetation instead of a seawall, it'll only enhance and reinforce your biodiversity efforts. So there'll be corridors that can be made. There can be um, ways to bring back missing elements of, let's say, the food chain. And these are things you wouldn't necessarily derive from hard infrastructure. So it's not so much about doing the two in isolation, but very much doing nat nature-based solutions because it reinforces our conservation efforts. And it provides that connectivity um, and, and that uh, um, that the bigger scale benefit that maybe gray infrastructure would take away. But this is not to say one is the enemy of the other. It's very much looking at where it makes sense and where gray infrastructure will still be needed. But no, it's not implying at all that we're doing the two things separately. No, I, I'm actually very excited about learning, learning more and getting more evidence for hybrid solutions and looking more at, you know, how can we have the most effective, most impactful solution that combines those approaches? Okay, so now we're gonna we're gonna go and get a different stakeholder opinion or input from uh, Foko van der Boot. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, who's joining us from Boscalis? Foko, if you can introduce yourself and uh, please share what you your input. Thank you, uh, Daisy. Uh, my name is Foko van der Goot. I work indeed for Boscalis, which is um, um, a Dutch marine contractor. Um, but also, and perhaps more importantly for this session, I work as a program manager um, at the EcoShape Foundations, which runs the Building with Nature program. And the Building with Nature program focuses on uh, implementing nature-based solutions for uh, hydraulic infrastructure. And we've been working on this concept for the past 10 years, mainly in the Netherlands, but also in, in Asia. First of all, I would like to uh, uh, thank Daisy and uh, Ratika for organizing this event and also for uh, launching the, the great uh, uh, um, guidelines. Um, it's interesting to see that uh, we have been working on the building nature concept for 10 years and we now we have derived a set of sort of enablers or barriers that we see that are needed to overcome to implement nature-based solutions for hydraulic infrastructure. And these are very similar to the, uh, the subjects you are addressing in this guideline. So apparently there's, a, there's almost like a universal um, so these are universal subjects that apply to uh, all sectors and perhaps also in all countries. So that's, there's, a, there's a great overlap in that. Um, my question is about um, getting the guidelines implemented. Um, as a marine contractor, we see, especially at the, the more regional projects, um, that our clients have a very focused um, a goal to realize their, um, their, their, their infrastructure project, for example, uh, construction of dikes, port development, uh, works in estuaries or be beach restoration. Um, and these, these project owners often do not have um, uh, per se an interest to, um, to look at the wider system. Um, although as a contract, we see opportunities to, for example, reuse uh, uh, beneficial reuse of materials or use nature-based elements in flood defense systems, make use of vegetation, uh, etc. Uh, but often the client is not uh, sensitive for this uh, because there is no incentive for him to, to do this. Can you uh, explain how these guidelines um, can contribute to creating incentives for more, the, let's say, the regional uh, project owners and private project owners to also invest in these type of uh, solutions? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Foko van der Hoot. I hope I pronounced it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, that's, that is an excellent question and I have to say I, I'm particularly excited about it because uh, uh, the main part of my work is working on this global standard for nature-based solutions and, and from the very beginning we've been aware how intersectional the topic of nature-based solutions is. So it's been a very collaborative process and one of the things we've kept in mind is what is the added value, um, which has not been easy. It's a it's been a, very ambitious, you know, we want to help project managers on the ground, but we also need to help 
large donors be able to hold projects accountable and look at a portfolio. So I, I yeah, uh, we're, we're working hard on that. And we, and I, I'll just want to answer you now, the, the added value there is on one hand, it's very, uh, it's a facilitative standard. So it's a process oriented. So it should empower and enable people to design strong nature-based solutions. If you're already doing a type of nature-based solutions, because nature-based solutions is an umbrella term, uh, such as ecosystem-based adaptation or forest landscape restoration, you could both increase uh, your credibility, but mostly, you know, appreciate the strengths and weaknesses of your intervention. So you could use that both for driving in more resources, but also improving the impact of your of your intervention by looking at those weaknesses in in accordance with those eight criteria. And then there's the scaling up component because right now we see a lot of small pilots of nature-based solutions. There are some excellent examples of like eco-safe roads in Nepal or mangrove restorations for protection uh, in Southeast Asia. But for them to really become strong nature-based solutions, they have to be seen at a larger scale. And the standard therefore, again, it's not punishing, it's not in any way punishing smaller interventions, but instead should be incentivizing good, strong interventions to grow if they have that potential. Um, and yeah, we hope to build that evidence base and business case so it's more robust so that we can connect with other sectors such as the finance sector, such as different politics and policies. So anyway, enough from me, because I'm a, I put my moderator hat back on. Uh, we now have, um, we're gonna have an intervention just from Bruno, who's gonna bring us into the current crisis context a little bit. Uh, and then we'll be going back out to the regions uh, for uh, our regional director, Boris, to provide some, some input. So Bruno, if you could introduce yourself and, and uh, yeah, speak up. Hello, can you hear me, yeah. uh, Daisy? Yeah, uh, thank you, Daisy. Uh, my name is Bruno Harbert. I'm the uh, uh, lead in risk and vulnerability at the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. And uh, as you can imagine, we are, uh, as a humanitarian organization, very heavily involved in the current uh, COVID crisis, both in terms of response to it, but also in uh, trying to reduce and, and maybe prevent uh, second and third waves. So my question was, uh, how does NBS see its role in trying to solve the COVID crisis or contribute to it? And related to that question, I'm a bit puzzled by the use of the term solutions, uh, because it's like you're you will be able to, to solve all the issues of, of the planet, while maybe in some cases it's more a question of contributions or approaches to, to uh, solve together with other sectors. So just uh, two questions which are related. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno, uh, so much for bringing us into the, the present uh, COVID crisis that we're fo fo uh, facing. Next up is Boris. Uh, Boris. You hear me? Yeah, yeah. thank, th yes, yeah, sir. So Thanks, fun. Daisy. <laughs> sure. Happy biodiversity day to everyone. I'm not sure if I'll manage to bring us out of the crisis, but at least to bring in a little bit of a regional perspective. I, 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 I'm regional director of ICM for, for Eastern Europe and Central Asia. We work across a, a vast geography. And um, just a few reflections, I mean, in terms of uh, uh, a sense of urgency. I mean, you know, 10 plus years back when we were pioneering this. Uh, this approach it was we were almost like nowhere, you know. But uh, today we've seen uh, uh, being mainstream into into some uh, 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 key processes, and 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 some of them really non-traditional, I would say, uh, uh, environmental or, or conservation groups. I mean, World Economic Forum and similar, so putting nature risks very high at their global risk matrix. Uh, just a couple of days, we've seen the launch of the EU Biodiversity Strategy to 2030 which sets very clear and I would say bold and ambitious targets in terms of both conservation and restoration with 30% of land and sea to be protected, 10% of, 10 of it uh, with strict protection and the billions of trees being planted and, 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 and thousands of kilometers uh, of rivers being, being uh, free flowing. Of course, that has to be followed with, with clear uh, resource mobilization. So there is a sense of, I would say, urgency and, 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 and COVID, in a way, this, this, this global crisis uh, puts us in the uh, nature-based solutions in the, uh, uh, in the spotlight. Yeah. At, at sub-regional level here in, in the Western Balkans, what we try to do, we try to uh, pool together really a broad partnership, including decision-making, state, local authorities, research institutes. We hope to, to see more of the private sector in it, because that's really also for them. 
uh, in, uh, in, in pulling off some solutions. So it's not just policy work, but also uh, piloting some nature-based solutions on the ground and then monitoring their impact. So I'm really happy. It's not going to happen tomorrow, but I mean, it's pretty much uh, 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 moving fast and in, in, in trying to demonstrate that nature-based solutions can work. So in that sense, I think that we are getting closer to where we want to be and, and to have nature-based solutions really discussed where, where decisions are being taken. Uh, so from that perspective, I think that uh, that we are moving along and it's really good to have this discussion here and then so many people listening to uh, to our little chat today. Thank you, Boris. And yeah, indeed, we have over 200 people watching live on YouTube right now. So next up, we have some hard questions coming from Veronica Ruiz, uh, my colleague, and then over out again to the regions to Rakib. So Veronica, introduce yourself and ask your question. Yeah, I would like to say hello to everybody and everybody that is listening to us on, on watching us on YouTube. So um, uh, this is more of a question for, for the people that we have in the room. And I will take advantage of this diverse group to uh, better understand even if there is a global moment to generating on nature solutions. And also, as Boris said, there is a sense of urgency you know, to to uh, tackle nature uh, challenges. I would like to know from you, people coming from different sector, humanitarian sector, coming from the uh, labor sector, economic sector, what are the most pressing needs or what are the major challenges that you are facing for an enhanced nature solutions uptake? So how are the challenges that you are facing that, that may be hindering the fact of including nature resolution within your within your work. Sorry, did you maybe Mito can can elaborate on that because we have talked a bit about this with, with uh, yeah absolutely uh, Mito uh, if you could highlight the links uh, that Veronica talked about. Okay so good <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mito Tsukamoto. I'm the head of the development and investment branch at the ILO, um, where the ILO's mandate is about social justice in the world of work. So, you know, um, a lot of this focus on labor and then how to this links to environment is something of great interest to us. And over the last decades, we have been really trying to advocate and promote um, how public investments or private investments can be more geared towards um, having better benefits in the environmental field. I just wanted to, you know, just in the, from the previous discussions, I thought it was important to highlight some of the, the situation that we're living in now. I mean, we're living in a very volatile world where inequality is continuing to grow, um, you know, where we're seeing more environmental degradation and, uh, and the accelerating pace of biodiversity loss, which I obviously don't need to remind this audience. But I just wanted to highlight some figures because I think it's quite important to put this into perspective of, um, you know, outside of the environmental field, what is actually happening. Before COVID, um, there were already some 2 billion people that were living in fragile and conflict affected situations. We have a staggering 700 million workers who are um, working, you know, who are globally living in poverty despite having employment. These people we tend to call, you know, working poor. Um, and we also know that poverty is increasingly concentrated in, in environmentally fragile and conflict affected situations. Um, where already before COVID, we were estimating that from 17%. At present, it was going to be increasing up to about 50% in 2030. And now with COVID, the most recent estimates that the ILO has come out with have shown that, you know, the, in terms of working time, this is, you know, we, there would be a loss of working time of an equivalent of some 305 um, million full-time jobs. And I think it's really important to kind of put this into perspective because there's so many benefits of actually looking at uh, problems that we have that we're facing now, whether it's inequality, whether it's environmental degradation, and the needs, I mean, what are some of the solutions? We need to look at better water and soil conservation schemes. We need to look at better um, ways to, you know, to, to protect uh, biodiversity through some of the, um, you know, assessing through some of the infrastructure works. How can we, you know, look at alternative methods as Michael was already mentioning, you know, with mangroves and other types of appropriate technology, which are very conducive to labor. Um, and I think bringing all of this together, you know, looking at how can, um, how can we move towards a more nature-based system that would also ensure you know, sustainable, sustainable approaches of decent job um, and creating resilience with the communities. I thought it was interesting the Loess Plateau example that Radhika gave and also the examples of you know, how, can, how can we ensure that um, 
you know, they, they were actually passing along this message to the local communities on how to, you know, ensure that, um, I mean, nature-based solutions are part of oftentimes many of the local communities and in, in their, their ways of living. But I think it's also um, as part of, you know, you, in, in, in a lot of our own interventions is how do we ensure that lo local communities and, uh, you know, in, in the populations there are also, um, you know, th that their capacities are being strengthened, that the local institutions are being strengthened to take into consideration how in their actions, they can also, you know, contribute to protecting biodiversity better. Um, so I just wanted to bring that, bring that perspective into light because I think there are multiple wins in what we're doing. We can address poverty, we can address inequality, we can increase job opportunities, we can increase income security for most of the local populations, which I had mentioned at the beginning, are living in many of these fragile um, environmentally degraded areas. So I wanted to bring that um, perspective into light. Thank you. Thank you, Mito. And you mentioned you had some figures to share, which hopefully we can share uh, once this webinar is you know, recorded and online. Um, so next up, I believe we have Rakib who has a question for us from the regions. Rakib. Hi, everybody. Um, um, I have a follow-up question from me too, but we'll ask, I'll ask it later. But, um, now what I want to ask is, uh, there is a fear of overgeneralization of NBS, uh, oversimplification of it. Why do you draw the line as what to consider as nature or natural? For example, GMO or uh, geoengineering like ocean fertilization to combat uh, carbon dioxide sequestration, uh, something like that. So, uh, I mean, what is the answer for that? Thank you, Rakib. And uh, actually, Foco uh, mentioned that he'd like to respond to Mito direct uh, for to Mito directly, I believe. So, Foco, if you could uh, online. Uh, it was uh, responding to, to, to Veronica's uh, question, uh, actually. Um, she asked what the, the main you know, main issue, issues are we are facing uh, or, or stopping us from, from implementing nature-based solutions. And from, an, from a, a water infrastructure um, a perspective, we see that uh, nature-based solutions are, like, per definition, dynamic, they're multifunctional, they're innovative, so they're they're often uh, there's often uh, limited um, uh, proven concepts, and they're con context specific. So, for all these elements, um, there are many ways to overcome it. Um, but I think the key aspect is um, that you, from a very early stage, collaborate with all the sectors involved for that specific issue you are working on, and it's not only at the that not only at the government level or uh, intergovernmental level, but also intersectoral. Uh, so together with NGO, together with private sector, uh, and together with uh, with knowledge institutes um, to overcome um, these uh, um, uh, th these barriers. Thank you, Foco. And uh, again, thank you to everyone online for listening. This uh, interactive discussion is really heating up. So we have quite a few. Um, few people lined up. Uh, next we'll go to, to Paul, back to, to, to Paul with his colorful background and then it, uh, we'll be looking out back to our youth component and into the regions. Paul. Thank you Daisy. Yeah and, and following Veronica and Mito for the excellent question and Mito your insight. It, it feels to me that we're at the point of values recognition and um, you know the, the way we've seen some of our leaders and influences values exposed during this period makes me wonder what part we can play in highlighting the need for people to display their values before we vote for them. You know, whether we're voting for chief execs of business boards or voting for politicians or community leaders, I would love to see the day where the, the voting sheet had a big thing above it and it said values, you know, uh, it would be normal for people to display their values before we would even vote for them. You know, the number one thing is their values. And I see that as being quite the, the, the change in society values that might just help us all. Um, and for me, the, 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 the saying of, of the day is the good man, uh, Michael, you know, um, you know, don't buy cement, but buy labor and mangroves. I think that says it all for me. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Thanks, Paul. Um, so next, uh, we'd like to hear some, something more from the youth. So Fernando, I believe you're, you're in Spain based in Spain, uh, if you could introduce yourself and. Yeah, 
Hello, everybody. I'm Fernando. I am talking from Spain, actually. And I represent the Youth for Nature movement, a movement led by youth to the youth. So um, in the last years and the last climate debates, we have seen how nature-based solutions has entered into the room in the UN Climate Summit and in the last COP in Madrid. So my question is how um, IUCN team are expected from the from the global standard to rise the momentum and the political willingness because for JALF it's important to, to trust in the concept to keep working on it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Fernando. And uh, Radhika is keeping a good check on all these questions. So she'll be doing a, a summary, a summary at the end to make sure we haven't missed anything. Um, next, next up, we have Anna Kaplina from UNHCR, who'd like to continue to answer Veronica's question. So Veronica, you asked a really good question, uh, holding people accountable. Yeah, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to send. Veronica, thank you so much for this question because it's very relevant for us. And obviously connection and reliance of refugees and host communities on nature, on environment, really cannot be underestimated. And yet we do not properly understand how to make this relationship with nature more mutually beneficial and less damaging in many instances. So um, we as a, as a protection focused organization often lack the capacity to look into nature-based solutions. So here is the first challenge and we are uh, very proud of our cooperation with IUCN in Bangladesh and uh, fantastic projects on addressing uh, human nature um, conflict it's instances of snakes and elephants um, uh, in the camps there. And, and we are hoping that we can bring in um, IUCN and other uh, knowledgeable actors to help us uh, here. And then the second challenge, I'm just picking up on some because I understand we are almost out of time, but the second challenge is of course, how to bring um, funding to address those issues and how to um, stop being reliant solely on donor funding. So what is the business model that can help us to bring sustainable financial flows to address, to bring more projects on nature-based solution? Thank you, over from me. Brilliant, Anna, thank you. And I hope everyone back at home watching on YouTube is also thinking, you know, how, how can we be held accountable and, and thinking how to answer Veronica's question. Um, so after, after Anna, um, so we'll, we'll eventually come to Radhika to, to have a summary. Um, but yeah, and I think actually that's now. So unless we have any specific questions for anyone, I don't see anyone's hands up. Thank you again for watching. Radhika, are you ready to sure. summary and answer all those questions? I hope you've been keeping a list. It's, it's been a great discussion. Sure. First, I think um, IUCN colleagues should not be allowed to ask questions. <laughs> yeah, for everybody listening, Veronica is a very close colleague of ours uh, working with us, and she's asked us a difficult question on purpose. And Rakib as well. I think, Rakib, you're right, and, and that's why we've started uh, using language like nature-inspired, nature-derived, nature-based. There, there was a slide on it. What is, how far do we go in terms of what is nature-based solution? But I think this is something also we need to work with several groups amongst the IUCN uh, experts, partners to, to continue to work out. This is the start of a definitive framework, but it's gonna evolve. Even the standard every four years is gonna be revised and will evolve backed up by a very strong scientific committee. So I think we don't have all the answers up front, but these are solutions, these are issues we, we need to address. Be, uh, to make sure that we can do this uh, nature-based solutions effectively and that they are relevant to, to the context at hand. I do want to go back to Bruno's question uh, on, on how we can address use nature-based solutions for the COVID crisis. I think similar to when disasters happen and we look at ecosystem-based disaster reduction, the timing is very important. We still need first response people are dying, there is a crisis. So we still need to make sure that our, you know, if we're not imposing message, there's a lot of messaging right now. There's a lot of noise around, you know, this was, this happened because of biodiversity loss. Uh, we told you so kind of messaging. People still need first response, they need help. So we also need to be sensitive to that in where we come in with our timing. If, you're, if you've got 
for example, in disasters, people still in temporary evacuation centers, how do you expect the government to listen that, hey, you need to restore your mangroves for the next disaster? So I think timing is very important there as well. This is a humanitarian crisis. And secondly, it's not, go we've tried in the past to make nature a solution for everything. And this is not working. This does not work. This is why we need a very defined process of looking at a problem and working towards a solution for a problem. So how can nature be a response to a societal challenge that we've identified and that we understand rather than saying nature is going to solve all our problems? That's the pressure we've put on us. And perhaps that's why we have some of the issues we're facing today. So I think if we're not saying that this is a solution for everything. This is a complementary solution. This is a purpose designed solution as a response to a, a societal need that we already are identified and understand. And this is also a solution for building back better. There's a lot of talk right now that if the, there's an eco economic reform, it needs to be climate proofed. So a lot of the debate around climate resilient infrastructure, climate resilient development is how nature is more, um, as Foucault was saying, more adaptable uh, with its dynamism, its complexity, how it's more durable. So those are the things also come back. In building back better from COVID, it needs to be climate responsive. And one of the climate responsive solutions is nature-based solutions. So I think there, there's a multiple, multiple things we're dealing with and it's quite complex, which is why it's so important that we do this together. IUCN is not going to be able to do it by itself. We need all of us to really understand, get behind this and make sure that there's a robust process that can be followed to design it rather than solutions that are solutions today and become problems tomorrow. Um, and in terms of Foco's uh, intervention, I think the incentive also is that there's more and more data about how um, nature-based solutions appreciate rather than depreciate over time there's less maintenance costs rather than more compared to hard infrastructure the generation of immediate benefits from nature-based solutions in parallel to the generation of immediate benefits from constructing infrastructure so i think there's a lot of work that's already come out of it um, that is available for us to inform not pitching one against the other, but very much how they can complement each other. But yes, for big businesses whose jobs are to perhaps, I guess, go in and, and build infrastructure and get out, we, we still need to get our messaging right. It's not so much the information is not there, it's getting that messaging right to inspire people to, to, to get behind this. Uh, I think that's what I had. There was one from Fernando on how do we roll out the standard and how do we get people, uh, how do we get people's support on the standard? So I think the standard is going to be valuable for people who need it. What we're trying to do basically with it is to actually go back to what Rakib highlighted, not anything and everything can be nature-based solutions. And nature-based solutions cannot be at the detriment of societal needs or people or rights. So how do we steer a good, robust process in designing NBS rather than identifying anything we want as nature-based solutions because there's a connection to nature. So I think the standard is really for people to look at the design and verification of NBS and come back and as a user community and help us improve it as we go along in the process. So it's not a very rigid set standard. It's, it's applied, th that's why it's so complex. <laughs> you know, it's a standard that looks like what it is today. And in four years, we may have learned a lot from it to actually transition into a whole new way of doing things where we found out there are certain elements missing from it and then we go back and improve it. And that will only happen again if we work together. And the revisions, the, the growth of the, the standard and this way of working, which hopefully becomes our new business as usual. I don't know if we've missed any others, but those were the ones I had where I felt they weren't fully answered. Anybody uh, else want to add to anybody? I don't know, Daisy? Uh, yeah, thanks Radhika. So we'll, if there's any final thoughts, I'd like to also close the session, I think with everybody unmuting and, and clapping for some of our frontline work, workers uh, who are working on COVID. Um, but yeah, if anybody has any final thoughts to sign off with, uh, speak up now for the people watching on YouTube, you know, we're all in this together is, I think, the message that we're getting, not just for Corona, but with biodiversity. Mason, Mito, uh, just no hands raised, jump in, interrupt each other, let's pretend we're in a thank, real thing. Thank you, Daisy. Just 
uh, to add on to what Radhika and the others had said on the, the rollout, just to let everybody know that here in the uh, Pacific, specifically in Fiji, we're working with SPREP, which is the regional mandated organization for the environment in the region. We're going to hold a training and awareness session for all the architects, the uh, planners, the draftsmen, the insurance providers, the financiers on nature-based solutions and how that can be uh, dovetailed into some of the gray infrastructure that they currently have. So that's an exciting uh, session. I just wanted to share that with everybody. That's how we're rolling it. Brilliant. Actually, I'd also like to call Alio. I'm so sorry. You'd, you'd mentioned that you'd wanted to say something and I, and I, I got lost in the, the, the many people that have been asking questions. So please, you know, help close us off, uh, close off this session. He's on mute. He is on mute. Let me see if I can unmute. Uh, okay, thank you. I understood that you, <laughs> you forgot. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> I, I will be very, very brief because we are, we are at the end of the session. Uh, in Paco region, West and Central Africa, we have very interesting experience with uh, nature-based solutions, mainly in the coastal zone restoring mangroves and generating incomes, protecting fisheries, etc. Very, very useful, very interesting experience. But if we, if we talk about NBS, most of our partners see that as a, like a, a, local, a local approach, which doesn't, which doesn't apply in the big scale, like regional and national. Where, and you, you know we want to, to influence policies at the national and regional levels. But I, maybe it is a problem of communication. But many of our partners look, see the NBS like uh, just a local solution, a local approach. How can we upscale it? And how can we consider NBS in communication or in conversation on in, in a national or an, an regional matters. Thank you. Great, I think it makes sense to, to close up now with Kaluki and I think Mito, let's have some final words uh, on, on this topic and then we'll finally, we'll end with that clap. I need to say, uh, Thanks everybody, and I've just put this up. It's, uh, it's today's the day we start our Global Biodiversity Festival. Three days. Uh, some of some of us here are on it together, so I look forward to seeing you there later today. And the hashtag, as you can see, is Global Biofest. Look forward to seeing you there. Brilliant. There's some excellent speakers, excellent speakers, including quite a lot of young professionals such as myself. Uh, Kaluki. Thank you so much, Daisy. Uh, just to. Uh, Throw it out there and thank everyone for the very inclusive language that we've been able to engage on today. And just uh, go on the crossroads of nature-based solutions and now I wish they call that can be a part of. Uh, to wind up, I just wanted to give a bit of a perspective, not just from youth for nature, but from youth for cast and youth led organizations. That yes, uh, activism is a very integral part of what we do as young people. But we also need to look beyond those lens and see the value that young people bring on, on the table in terms of the lived experiences and the energy that we put out there on, at the local level to implement some of these uh, restoration and other nature-based solutions. So I think moving forward, it will be important to also tap into this potential. And like uh, Radhika mentioned, it will be good to explore more uh, uh, pathways on how we can collaborate with young groups and youth organizations in order to ensure that uh, we are implementing these nature-based solutions, not just for now, but for the future generations for which most of us and people of today will live to enjoy and also keep transitioning to the future generation. So thank you so much. And thank you for the kind of conversation. You're, you're welcome, Kuki. And, and thank you again for everyone joining on, online. Uh, Mito, we're, we're coming to the end now and then we'd love to hear more just that final bit, you know, putting it in context of now and and what's coming, what's coming next, and I'm finishing with that gratitude clap. Mito. 
Okay, no, so I really want to thank um, IUCN for this. I think it's been very helpful to bring, you know, different experts from different backgrounds to come and discuss these issues. I think we're, you know, we're facing quite a lot of challenges in the future. Environment and is obviously one of them, um, but also the inequality issues, the issues in relation to the volatility and the grievances that could increase um, also with the current pandemic. So I think it's really important and it's even that much more um, uh, important that we actually work closely together to find the solutions, which will not, as Radhika said, it's very difficult for, for any of us from our institutions to work on these issues alone. And I think from a labor perspective, um, and oftentimes, you know, jobs and employment seems to come out as a residual, it should really be central to this because jobs can be a mechanism to address, you know, nature-based solutions. It's a choice, you know, whether we use gray infrastructure or green infrastructure, um, and I think those choices are extremely important for the youth of the future. Many of the youth are part of the part and parcel of our programs. And um, we do have, you know, some examples um, already of where we are working on reforestation or, um, you know, mangrove planting. And I think we need to do more of this to, to bring all the, the, the good things that we're all doing, but by bringing them together, I think that will just strengthen um, what we're trying to do in a much more sustainable way. But thank you again, IUCN. I think this was extremely helpful. And thank you, Mito, for joining. I mean, we've we've had discussions and we're working together. I mean, I think a big part of aim of this call was also to highlight the partnerships. In this room, we have explorers, we have people from around the world, we have you know regional directors, a mix of IUCN and other organizations, the private sector. And we need those strong partnerships and willing people who are willing to, to start those new collaborations. So looking forward to working specifically also with you, Mito. Um, and with that, I'd really like to close the session. I know we all have so much more to say and uh, many more questions, if not more than we had at the beginning. So we will be, you know, putting up this video, recorded video as well, and publishing some notes about it so we can also have some more of your input there. And so for now, I'm going to try and change us to a gallery view so I can see everyone. Uh, let's see if that works. Yeah, that's where we all are. Hopefully that also changes on the YouTube live screen. And I'm gonna ask you all to unmute yourself and we'll clap and, and say goodbye. And thank you again so much for this session, the, the presentation from Radhika. It's been absolutely fascinating. So yeah, uh, unmute and, and let's see if this works. It probably might not. Thank you everyone. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye, bye. Bye. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye